Right, let's go ahead and bring in our good friend from ESPN, Tom Luganbill. Uh, does a great job, too, with uh, our, our other friend, Barrett Sali, uh, on the radio as well. Tom, what's up, man? How you doing? I was just noticing that I think my background has your background beat. It does for exactly. sure. That green screen of the hotel room is absolutely amazing. <laughs> I mean, look at the glow of the lamps. You got, can you see a pillow? There's a couple pillows back there. I mean, Rocking. let's go. Yeah, no, no, without a doubt, man. I just, I just know that means you're on the road working. If you're on the road working, it's football yeah. season, baby. Uh, I, I want to start, it. Tom, uh, with some quarterback battles. And I want to start uh, in the SEC at Auburn. It's looking like TJ Finley is going to get the job. You had Zach Calzada that came over in the transfer portal. It seems like Auburn whiffed more than Babe Ruth would against Jacob DeGrom in the transfer portal at quarterback. <laughs> Robbie Ashford uh, gave them a, you know, gave him a little bit of a run. Holden garner has got some talent. What do you think the ceiling of TJ Finley is? And do you expect when he is named the starter that he could take a big jump? I kind of feel like we've already seen the ceiling. We've seen various iterations of him. He's had multiple opportunities to take over the reins. And quite honestly, back in the 2020 season, uh, when Miles Brennan went down at LSU, he had a chance to take that thing over and run away with it and couldn't do it. And so I'm, I'm curious to see what type of consistency that he can bring to the position for Auburn because – that's the one thing, and, and I've said this forever, and I, I, it, this will never change for me. Quarterback play is about two things. It's about decision-making and accuracy. Mm -hmm. And I don't just mean the decision-making of, all right, throw it to that guy because he's open. I'm talking about all the different things that go into playing the position, pre-snap, post-snap, getting out of a bad play, getting into the right play, recognition, and then the ability to process. That's all part of decision-making. And then when you throw the football, are you throwing an accurate, catchable ball where your guy can catch it and their guy cannot. And I think that's been something that's been a struggle for TJ Finley. He's very gifted. Nobody would look at him and say physically he doesn't have the tools to get the job done. But just as we've seen with DJ Uyunglele at Clemson a year ago, if you don't make great decisions and you're not accurate with the football, you're only going to take the offense so far. So I'm looking for consistency because I think Auburn's going to be better than people think they're going to be just because people think they're not going to be very good, I think that gives them a bit of a chip on the shoulder. Without a doubt, and it looked to me like, speaking about DJ, that, that TJ Finley, when he came in last year, his clock was slow. It looked like he was behind on everything. I mean, you'd see him throw yeah. routes, whether it was the slant, any type of route breaking across the middle of the dig, he was late. It was late, 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 and it looked like he was thinking. Because he's thinking. Yeah, that's exactly right. It looked yeah. like he was thinking and not reacting. Now, it's going to be interesting right. to see with an offseason now, uh, you know, maybe that the clock's going to speed up. He has had a chance to develop some rapport a little bit with those receivers. But then I want to go out to Oregon. You look at Bo Nix and Ty Thompson. I think Bo Nix is going to be the guy. Bo Nix has never played with the sure. legitimate offensive line. I know he's had some struggles, uh, you know, making bad decisions. But you look at the offense that Gus Malzahn ran, that, that route tree and, and the passing combinations were one step past third grade. It was so elementary. You'd <laughs> think I was going to solve cases with Watson. Now that he's out at Oregon, with an offensive line that should be sturdy, with some weapons around him, in a conference that isn't the SEC, if he does win the job, can you see Bo Nix putting together a really nice year? I, I can. Um, I think we've all seen Bo Nix at his best, and we've also seen him just make head-scratching decisions and plays. And the problem is, is what that means when you do that is that you're a streaky player. Yep. Now, can you coach that out of somebody? Can can the system and how you're being coached and what you're being asked to do, maybe it's going to be a better fit out West than it was under Gus Malzahn at Auburn. He's played a lot of football, guys. We, we've seen him have a lot of opportunities to consistently perform at a high level, and it's been a real struggle for him. I think the one thing that I've always questioned as I've watched him is, I love the arm talent. I like the deceptively good athleticism. He can make plays off platform and when, when things break down. But have you noticed that he's consistently a guy that will flush the pocket when he doesn't need to? Yes. He's consistently a guy that when he gets some pressure, instead of keeping his eyes downfield and staying within the offense and trusting what he's seeing and getting the ball out, his eyes come down and he flushes. Now, I don't know if that's ingrained in him, if that was a trust issue with either the personnel or the scheme, or if, if it's something that at Oregon, 
they're going to do some things differently scheme wise that doesn't put him in that position. I don't think anybody even knows the answer. The problem is we've consistently seen that from him. And if he is a guy like uh, for me, they're taking on Georgia. All right. When you look at Bo Nix and his performances against the top pure level teams in the SEC, they haven't been overly good days for, for Bo Nix. So I'm going to be very, very interested to see now that he's out of the SEC, coming back to play a team like Georgia, which version of Bo Nix will we end up seeing? Yeah, you know, it's, it's like an actor that, you know, the director, writer wrote a great scene and you want to improv it for no reason. Right. Sometimes you need to just stick <laughs> to the script. What do you got coming up? Well, let's go to Texas. Transfer quarterback Quinn Ewers has been named the starter. Steve Sarkeesian enters his second year. Bijan Robinson is one of the best running backs in the country. I'm looking down the schedule. Obviously, you'll, you'll host Alabama week two. You have to go to Texas Tech. You have to go to Oklahoma right. State. You have the Red River shootout. You close with Baylor at home. I mean, can Texas win the Big 12 this season? I, I think it's a year premature because they're talented in all the wrong places. Yeah, I have no idea where the pass rush is going to come from. There's a high likelihood they could end up starting three true freshmen in the offensive line. That's how devoid of depth and talent Texas is. Now, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but it's been over 21 years since Texas has had a first-round draft choice in the offensive line. That's unfathomable, right? And so – you build championship teams from the inside out. Steve Sarkeesian yes. knows that as well as anybody. The problem is all their talent is on the perimeter. And so there's lots of receivers and running backs littered throughout college football that could have potential to be difference makers. But what's the common denominator between the teams that are in the college football playoff each and every year? They are dominant football up teams up front. And Texas isn't there yet. And I personally, guys, I think the Quinn Ewers – I call it the Quinn Ewers experiment. It's going to be the most fascinating NIL story to date because essentially what we have here is maybe one of the most highly anticipated, overhyped quarterback prospects to ever step foot on a college football landscape in the last 10 years and has not thrown a pass since the completion of his junior year. And apparently he's a millionaire. Mm. And so all of this, all of this talk about, okay, well, Sark made the decision. Great, they made the decision. What choice did he have? He just, he had a horrible year a year ago. If he named Hudson Card the starter, he's in serious trouble with the people who got their hands in the cookie jar. So everything is riding on Quinn Ewers. Every, and, and Steve Sark Sarkeesian is riding on Quinn Ewers. And my question is, are they good enough in the key spots to be vastly improved from a year ago? I think they'll be improved. Are they in Baylor's category right now? Are they in Oklahoma State's category right now, particularly up front? Are they in Oklahoma's category? No. So I think the answer to can they win the Big 12 is a no for this season. Yeah, we were just talking about whether or not Steve Sarkeesian actually had full control to even name that starter, so I like the point you made. Um, I want to go to the ACC because Clemson is one of the more intriguing teams to me this season. Clearly, they have they return an elite defense, uh, uh, You know, have to change out both coordinators, and they have some question marks at quarterback. NC State is a very good football team, but you get them at home. Yeah. Mario Cristobal's in Miami now, but you get them at home. Is Clemson a lock to win the ACC? I, I think if you're looking at the talent profile, the answer is yes. Now, my broadcast crew finished the season with Clemson. One of our bowl games was the Cheez It Bowl against Iowa State. And we happened to open with them on Labor Day night as they take on uh, Georgia Tech at Mercedes Benz Stadium. And so I feel like I've had an off season of being intimately familiar with, with this football team. Clemson has dudes. All right. This isn't a team that went eight and four by surprise last year. This is a team that had just about everything go wrong for them and won 10 games. 10 games yeah. The sky is not falling in Clemson, South Carolina. And I think, and I would make the argument, this is Dabo Sweeney's best coaching job in 2021, and here's why. Everybody in that community, whether it's in the locker room, in the building, the athletic director, the president, the faculty, somebody selling hot dogs on the sidewalk, nobody in that program has ever faced any adversity. Nobody has ever faced any harsh criticism. Nobody has ever said, oh, what's wrong with you guys? You're four and three. This is ridiculous. You know what happens when that happens to most teams? They go in the tank. And that team did not do that. They were obliterated at the skill spots due to injury, play with a freshman running back. They were below average in the offensive line. They had a quarterback that couldn't hit water if he fell out of a boat. <laughs> and they were loaded on defense. Okay? They still won 10 games. Now – you're going to have a bunch of those guys at the skill spots back that played yeah. a bunch last year. 
I don't think they're going to be elite in the offensive line, but I think they're going to be improved. The question becomes, can DJ Uyunglele make the routine plays? That's the thing that was concerning. I don't care how big he is. I don't care how strong his arm is. I don't care that he's lost 30 pounds. All of that stuff's great. I know that his knee is healthier than it was a year ago. The bottom line is he has to make the routine plays that are there to be made. And when he has open targets downfield, he can't miss them. That's the biggest difference between the offense and the passing game last year for Clemson and Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence's performances at Clemson. Their average yards per pass attempt was a monster number, and that's a reflection of explosive plays. Look at it last year. It was way down. So now you got Cade Klubnick, the freshman, hanging in there, kind of lingering, and guess what he does? He's accurate with the football. So I'm not so sure that DJ won't have a fairly short leash here as we kick off the season for Clemson. Hmm. Look, I'm with it. And you talk about dudes, that defense. Yeah. Oh, that, my they may They may have the best one in the country. It's, it's, everybody's not down there holding hands, reading nursery rhymes to each other. Let's just you put know, it that way. <laughs> you're right. And, Jake, one other thing to add to that. You know, everybody yeah. talks about, okay, well, they had to turn over coordinators and, and haven't done that before. He has done that before. And when he's, when he's done it, he's promoted from within. Outside of the Chad Morris hire, he has groomed guys within the program. So you minimize distraction. You minimize having to reteach and relearn because everybody's toe in the rope in the same direction, coaching staff wise. Yeah, for sure. And and again, Dabo's proven he knows how to push the right buttons because a lot of times it's not about how many X's and O's you know as a head coach. It's how you know how to hire, yep. who you hire, yep. and how well they do. What you got me? I'm gonna go straight to the Booster Club here. Dylan Meadows uh, hashtag asked Tom, which team do you believe won't live up to the hype this year? Hmm. Oh, that is, that, that's a really, really good question. I think the answer for me, and I, and I say hype, and, I, I, and I, again, I'm answering this because I think they're overranked right now, mm. but how USC is ranked in the top 25 of the AP poll is flat out laughable to me. Now, they may end up doubling their win total. Okay, let's say they do. That means they're eight and four. Okay, I think that's a really good coaching job. I think they will maximize the most out of their transfer portal additions, but they have the same problem that the University of Texas has. They went out and got all of these transfer portal guys. None of them play in the offensive line. None yeah. of them are difference makers in the defensive front. That's concerning. Their best defensive player might end up being the Arizona State transfer, Eric Gentry, who if he gains weight, he might develop into being a first-round draft choice one day. But when you look at SC, you don't see the SC of old in the offensive line and the defensive line. And if you recall some of those Oklahoma offenses that Lincoln Riley had, they had some dudes in their offensive line now. I mean, they did. SC does not have that. So I think a lot of the offseason hype and a lot of the transfer portal news and the pedigree of Lincoln Riley, the fact that it's SC, you've got all of the NIL dollars coming in, so players are you know flocking to it. That's all fine and dandy. I think that's what's earned their top, their, their preseason ranking. I don't think their roster has earned their preseason ranking, and they may be vastly improved, but to have a top 15 ranking, I think, was laughable. Yeah, I mean, you, you, when you look at, at USC, you better watch out for Fresno State early. I'm just telling you, even though you it's got home, that right, you better watch out for Fresno State early because Jake Hayner's over there throwing Patronus spells. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, speaking of USC, Steve the Pirate. God, I love that name. <laughs> Does UCLA, every time, I, every time I hear that name, I just think of the in the dodgeball. Well, yeah. The, dodgeball. the chest out. <laughs> we just give him like, then who am I going to share treasure this treasure with? with? He's like, I think of that every time. Peter. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Steve the Pirate wants to know, does UCLA have a better year than USC? UCLA could be sneaky this year. They, man, Charbonnet, I love give the way the that. I'm telling you, my, my comp, Tom, before we answer that question, I think that yeah. this may be the best comp I got. Zach Charbonnet, James Conner. It's clone. Clone Ooh, like the way they run the ball. Very good one. I like that a lot. I, I think uh, as DTR goes, UCLA will go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he is a very, very gifted guy that has also at times been very streaky. And then he has a penchant for getting injured. If he stays healthy and can finally, he's got a lot of experience now. If he stays healthy and can consistently perform, I, I think that they Will they have the better year? I don't know. Will they have the better team top to bottom as a whole? And probably so. And a lot of people may disagree with me in that regard. But, you know, it's interesting. that The, the conversation that we're having today, so much of them revolve around the quarterback position, right? Just how hard that position is to play, how hard it is to project. If you have one, you have a chance. If you don't, you don't. And so whether we're talking about UCLA or, or USC as we, as we have here, 
I, I think if those two players play well for both of those programs, those programs are going to be vastly improved. Yeah, he earned my respect too. That dude took a beating last year and he got did. up. And, yeah. and you talk about coming back from adversity, struggled early, put the ball in harm's way. That's something he's got to watch out for this year. But down the stretch last year, I mean, they went to USC and pulled their pants down in front of the whole high school now. Yeah. No like doubt. It's, it, he, he absolutely balled, and that dude's tough. And uh, yeah, I know we always say for quarterbacks, you don't want the first thing to say about your quarterback is that he's tough. Because typically when you say that, that means he's just not that great. Like they're like, Zach Calzada, he's tough. That's You know what? It's like Blaine said, you know what I want my quarterback to do? Throw the ball good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank right. the right calls. Be smart. The- be talented. How about this? When they, when, they, when they tell somebody uh, it's it's a negative to call a guy a game manager. Oh, it's you want a, you know a coach? Don't, don't get you know us a started. Coach that doesn't want their quarterback to manage exactly. the game. Is there one out there? Because I've never found him. It's I don't the know worst. Tom, Tom, it may be the worst ter- term in sports. <laughs> It's like saying, well, that CEO, he's just a good business manager. Yeah. Well, (laughs) duh. Or it's like, you know this pitcher? He's just a game manager. Yeah, you need to know what the count is. You need to know what the pitch is. What do you have? A quarterback just goes out there and he's like, doesn't even look at the clock. Doesn't even look at the play call. He's just out there being super athletic. It's We have to come up with another term. And I've been thinking and maybe it's like, Athletically challenged or something like that. Maybe it's somewhere in that realm. What are we supposed to call Stetson Bennett? Yeah, I mean, it's it's right. It's nuts. Kirk Cousins. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) No, it is. It's the worst term. And Tom, we will talk about this for the rest of the show if you let me go on. This is this is my thing. And the crazy thing is, I hear like former quarterbacks that are on huge networks use the term. I'm like, dude, no. you know this. Dude, I, was, yeah. I was a four-year starter at quarterback, and I still look back and say, I wish I managed games better. I mean, like, it I mean, just blows exactly. my it's mind exactly. how bad of a term. So it's like, it's like uh, the term, uh, I was on a radio show the other day. It was like, yeah, it's, that's like the term professional hitter. When they're talking about major league right. baseball, like, that guy's a professional hitter. Well, <laughs> duh. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's just like pre-boarding on an airplane. No, you're just the first people to board. I don't know why we do this. I don't know. You got another one, B? Um, yeah, Travis Elrod wants to know, is arm strength overrated as a QB metric, or is it just a part of accuracy? Um, I think to some degree it's overrated at the collegiate level, but it's yeah. in many ways, shape, and form a, a necessary uh, component at the next level because the windows become so tight. Yeah. And, and, and the, the caliber of player – and the speed at which things are happening. You watch on a Sunday, pay close attention to, to some of the little spots, the little six-by-six six boxes that these quarterbacks are fitting the ball into. And if they're a hair, a hair second late, if they're a half step uh, off of their drop, the ball's picked off or it's deflected. I think in college football, with the variety of different defenses that we have, if you're an anticipator, if you're a rhythm and timing guy, I don't think you have to have an elite arm. I think you have to have quality arm strength. Like, for example, mm-hmm. Cade, Cade Klubnik. Cade Klubnik is not going to wow anybody with pure arm talent. But what he does is he anticipates throws, throws guys open, and the end result is very, very positive. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when I was talking about the top two things at the quarterback decision or, or decision-making and accuracy, I didn't use arm strength as one of those. Mm-hmm. I'd love to have it. You'd love to see it. But you know what I think is even more important than arm strength is I guess? arm talent. Yes. Arm talent Feel. and nuance. And so, so, for example, what we're seeing now from people is the ability to throw off platform and change your arm angle, lower exactly. your elbow, get above people, around people, get the ball out, change ball speed. Some guys have big, strong arms. Zach yep. Calzada is the prime example. Coming out of high school, guy can throw the ball 100 miles an hour. But that is, there's not any nuance. There's no, mm-hmm. hey, the, the drive route's coming to six yards in front of you, and you throw it like a 20-yard dig yep. 100 miles an hour. So I think those little things become a little bit more important when it comes to, to quarterback play. Definitely. I'd much rather have a guy that may not have the strongest arm or the weakest arm, but he can throw the lollipop screen on the mm-hmm. slip like he's talking about. Right. You got to feel it, and I always use the analogy to pitchers. You can't go out there and just throw the fastball. Exactly. I don't care if it's 102 miles per hour. You got to be able to not only throw the off speed, but you got to be able to pitch backwards. 
You know, you got to know when to say when. And a lot of that isn't just how strong your arm is. It's how much feel. The word nuance is a great word to use. And instinct as well. I think people yes. are born natural throwers of the ball. Mm-hmm. It is so hard to teach somebody how to take something off a ball and have to know I need to take something off this ball and not just throw it 100 miles per hour. There's like a you big said. difference Bill, between a Bill great Walsh. thrower and a great passer. Yep. Right. Bill Walsh used to call that a knack for passing. Yep. Yep. It's he it's the truth. The guy has a knack for passing. Yep. Mm-hmm. It, it's truth. But Tom, great stuff. Tom looking at ESPN, man. Can't wait to get you back on. I'm so glad we got football this weekend starting off in week zero, which again makes no sense. It's like patient zero. What is that? A ghost. Uh, but I'm not gonna get into that. But uh, man, I really appreciate you coming on and, and obviously we're gonna do it again soon. All uh, right, just make sure you guys manage the rest of the show. Uh, next time I come on, I'm going to probably get uh, have a public bathroom behind me. We'll see what nice. we can do to, you know, to improve the backdrop. Here. Well, look, I know room, serv- room service is right to your left, and, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a good time. Right <laughs> All right, my friend. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate Tom. See you, man. See you, guys. Hey, if you like what you heard and you want to hear more, go on over to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher. Check out Crane & Company live every day from 2 to 3 Central, where you can hear us spit it straight.